Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much to um, Professor Mohamed Mahmoud Old Mohamedov for taking part in this um, extra event in the run-up to the Rabat, Spring, Rabat Winter School 2023. Um, and thank you also to Alessandro Bordino from the University of Bologna for joining us. Now, um, Alessandro has some technical uh, limitations with his sound at the moment, so I'm going to read out his first question. Um, and it is as follows. In your reading, um, A Century of Elusive State Building in the Middle East and North Africa, you outlined how post-colonial states in the MENA region have inherited the arbitrary use of power used by the colonial states and used it to institutionalize a specific structure of power under the banner of state building, thus creating half-born states. Subsequently, the war on terror has further impeded the project of statehood in the Middle East, as it showed the population that the destiny of their states was still directly or indirectly determined by outside powers, fueling the uproar in the region that led to the Arab Spring. As you made clear that the question of citizenship in terms of creation of a social contract between elites and population to which the use of power was to be held accountable was not addressed after the Arab Spring. As such, I wanted to ask you the following question. While the construction of such a contract must come from within, what approach should Western countries adopt when approaching autocrats to avoid fueling the anti-imperialist narratives used to justify the status quo thus hindering the process of grassroots movements in imagining an alternative statehood. Should they just sit and watch, or is there a way for them to support the creation of a new contract without continuing their tradition of negative interference? Well, thank you very much for this excellent question and um, my very best to the organizers and the participants to this extremely important gathering. Um, I'm very happy to contribute it, uh, in this way. Uh, and addressing these uh, questions. Um, I think the, the question um, raises um, a, a deeper issue of how do we assess not so much the performance and therefore international implications, but rather the trajectory of uh, the states in the Middle East and North Africa. And that's a wide ensemble with the specificities in the Mashriq and the Maghreb and um, the Sham in the Nile Valley and so on and so forth. But there is a level where we can discuss the nature of that state in the contemporary era. How do we assess that um, trajectory rather than performance? Uh, and how do we link it to uh, ways forward? So there's any number of um, points or dimensions that one can choose to highlight. And if you look at the literature, I think there's been an overemphasis on questions of security and questions of performance in a type of failed state paradigm discussion since the mid 90s onto the 2020s. What I suggest is more of a historicization, which essentially places at the center of this, the question of statehood itself, which I regard as central to the evolution of these systems. I think that a combination of factors, which is the fall of the Ottoman empire, although less felt in the Maghreb, but still it is very much a large um, actor at the rise of colonialism itself since the mid, uh, middle of the 19th century and the ushering of the modern day era, um, as well as the nationalist movements and the religious movements in all of these territories, combined to place statehood at the center of this project. And as such, therefore, that question tells, raises the point of what kind of state is the post-colonial state circa roughly 1950s and 1960s. And if we go with that, what we have generically, again, subject to a lot of contextualizations in each one of these countries, uh, but generically we have a type of state that essentially, as I, as I use this phrase of half born, is not in control of that trajectory. It has been shaped factually, documentarily by colonialism. It is inherited as a system, it's hollow, it's there structurally at, at best in those places where colonialism has been the longest, but of course the longest, the, the, the colonialism, the more troubled and traumatized um, the, the country itself. Look at how Algeria was raped by France for plus a century and the consequences for that post-colonial state. Uh, 
So you have a, a hollow system. And as a result of that, the performance is going to be, as we see it elsewhere, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa, um, parts of Asia, as an inevitable kind of actor that will rely on uh, divide and rule, on forcing narratives, which gradually will evaporate from the importance of nationalism, allowing religion to rise throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And by the tail end of that, put that system at a dead end. And with one, two generations of um, youth, generally, but social activists, militants, political opponents, uh, simply average citizens um, demanding rights, representation, accountability, yes, democracy, um, will we move towards this inevitable appointment with that moment in the early 2010s, which we will call for shorthand purposes, the Arab Spring, but is really a state building moment of, of, uh, uh, of reckoning fundamentally. So that's what I think is at the heart of this. What I think has been problematic has been this overemphasis in the West that it is a story about the West and that the West has to do something about this uh, and where it has to position itself and should it sit and watch or should it essentially intervene and so on. I ask the question, why is this a question in the first place? If we look at agency, which is an important concept in the English language, agency is fundamentally going to place it in the hands of those actors um, with successes and failures. And that's how state building moves forward. So that does not preclude cooperation, engagement, um, support, capacity building, all of these things that could be done in res mutual respect and engagement and partnerships. And a lot of this is happening in and around the Mediterranean or already, for instance, uh, with North Africa and the Southern part of Europe, for instance. But more generally, I wish we would move away from this kind of um, nearly automatic legitimacy to the question of interventionism, when interventionism has been systematically problematic, whether directly, militarily, or indirectly in other forms of interferences. And I think that's essentially what should be the question, not so much, in fact, to the people on the southern shore, but rather to a type of Eurocentric narrative that has long dominated um, beyond academia into, I think, the, the interstices of um, policymaking in Europe and in the United States um, uh, as such. Brilliant. If I could just um, possibly uh, pick up on a couple of um, ideas that came through there. And Alessandra, obviously, um, if you're if you're able and you and you have additional comments, please do pop them in the chat function and I'll read them out. But I'm really interested uh, to pick up on this idea that um, the so we have this sort of post-colonial state, which I think if I'm following um, correctly, is sort of characterized by sort of a profound um, dysfunctionality on, on, on multiple levels, that it's never really been fully allowed to realize itself in any one form or another, that it's this sort of crucible or cauldron of, of sort of contending um, issues and influences. And then this very idea that um, what must we do to clear that breathing space? You know, how should we be positioning ourselves, you know, or how should um, how should the sort of MENA region, if you will, as this is the focus of this particular conversation, how should they be clearing airspace in order to do some thinking about, you know, statehood and what, what sort of statehood in their own image looks like. And we should maybe reject that idea um, and say that we don't need to ask permission. We don't need to um, sort of uh, kind of do that in order to advance this project. But I think what what I took from Alessandro's original question was this idea, well, in a kind of real politic world, what would it be? How would you create that political breathing space, if you like, if there's if there is even an answer to this? Um, how would you create that political breathing space, having to deal with the attitudes and the actors in the way they are now? How do you go about even making space for a conversation about alternative statehood? Right. So on. Thank you for that. I, I think that's that the assessment of dysfunctionality is exactly this. Uh, there are dystrophies that are produced historically. And as social scientists, I think we observe them and document them. We should also say that there are two forces that preside over this historical process. 
which um, are nationalism and religion, which very early in the 20th century are present throughout the region as competing uh, trends. And they continue throughout this period. And, and, and gradually the religious one overtakes the narrative. Not so much who am I in this world and how can I achieve it through that state, which usually had, at the time was sometimes even near secular, to what do I believe in and how do I essentially find my space in anchoring it and building a project, which can become then a contra project as um, the Islamists, for instance, gradually uh, find grounding, uh, typically, for instance, in Egypt um, and in Syria and Iraq, as we see this. And so how does that space, how is that space carved out? I think it is being carved. I think we have to look at this um, as, as a glass half full. I think the more that dead end was obvious uh, in the 80s with socioeconomic riots throughout the region, the 70s, in fact, 1974 already in Egypt, um, to the 80s, to the 90s, um, as we get that acceleration with the over-securitization post 9-11, um, the region is not asking itself these questions in the manner that the Western world is asking, but rather more back to that which is needed, which is a space, a civil, uh, a civic contract that needs to happen. And I think that is what we see happening. Look at the movements in Lebanon as early as 2008, by extension, even uh, the 2009 movement in Iran, which is a parallel story, pre-Arab pre Spring, but connects and I think what's striking is how the universal nature of those categories, representation, accountability, uh, power sharing, constitutionality, um, uh, respect for minorities, uh, women's rights, youth, uh, and, and so on and so forth, um, and proper role for diversity, which includes religious actors that can and have played a proper political process um, in some of these countries. All of that is the conversation that builds up to the early 2010s. And then of course, what, what we see happening is that because of those changes, some conflicts happen and including armed conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Libya, and elsewhere. That's the nature of these processes. Violence does not have to happen. Conflict does not have to happen. But if you look at Latin America throughout the 70s and Eastern Europe in the 90s, political transitions have to deal with that possibility. So I think the carving of that space, if now we're bringing the partners in Europe and, and beyond, I think is a sort of recognition that the dynamic has to be all the time about respect and partnership, as I said uh, earlier, that the sharing of experience is not necessarily paternalistic, that you know, you've been there, you've seen these things, you can share them. And I think this can happen at all levels, including civil society including indeed academia. Um, and, uh, and beyond that, a certain kind of uh, accompanying of these uh, efforts rather than a directing of them. And, and that is an important element, this last one, because the directive nature of interventionism that I mentioned earlier has been the dominant themes since the 60s onwards, precisely because of the sub- performance of the post-colonial state writ large in that sense. And if you go into that, this op opens the possibilities to even intellectually consider um, ways of statehood that don't necessarily have to align with a Eurocentric perspective. Not that anything is wrong with the Eurocentric perspective, but it is the particular history and opens up vistas intellectually, which I think are extremely interesting. Wow, yeah, there's some really, really interesting ideas out of that. And um, I'm just, I think if, you, if, if you'll bear with me, I'd like to come back on a couple more of those before we move to the second um, question. So in a sense, there was almost this idea that whilst the post-colonial state in sort of practice and in sort of empirical terms has been largely dysfunctional um, for the reasons you were describing, perhaps also it's got its... Um, positive potential as well in some senses in the way that it can be uh, quite a creative space where different elements like you were saying there were some things some elements like constitutionality representation things like that 
which can travel through. Then there are sort of traditions, customs, cultural conventions, etc., which not all of which need to be discarded. Elements from religious discourses and practices, etc. All these are sort of like the rich building materials. So there's a lot of potential in there for reimagining um, a sort of ideas of, of statehood. Um, and then I just seeing as this is the sort of broad theme of the overall uh, winter school, I'm interested um, this notion that it's not just a case of this being done internally from the grassroots from within the region, but also the extent to which um, the major role that the West and, and the European Union, for example, can play is by sort of dropping some of these attitudes or narratives of intervention um, and actually starting from a, a kind of starting from a position of respectfulness um, in which case where does that leave do you think um, something like the very notion of the Maghreb as a sort of um, the very notion of this region between Africa and and Europe is that is that still a sort of is that part of the problem? Is that part of a narrative which is always looking, westernized, always looking at things in terms of what certain regions, certain places are doing for their own projects and their own interests? Do we need to, is that maybe no longer a constructive way to um, formulate sort of international relations policy towards um, the MENA region and others? Oh, not at all. I think quite, quite the opposite. I think that um, the, the Maghreb uh, is an extremely fertile um, sort of category to, to think and act. I don't, in fact, see any indications to the country historically, factually, uh, in recent and earlier dates. But before addressing that briefly, maybe I think you're right in pointing out and being fair to the post-colonial state, as you said earlier, it did at the time, nonetheless, in spite of all of the limitations we indicated, have this kind of center of gravity around nation, even nation state, which at least gave the possibility of that conversation, uh, which was at times very, very rich. Look at some of the trade unions in, in, in uh, Tunisia, for instance, um, and um, in intellectual work publications throughout the, the Arab world as opposed to the atomization we have seen in, in recent years because of the conflicts that have been, have been growing and this sort of um, existential crisis of the state. So I think that is an important fair point to, as you noted, to, to that uh, earlier phase uh, as it is. As for the Maghreb, uh, no, I think that it has been, in spite of its internal paralysis and the crisis that has been there perennially since the 90s, I think as an ensemble, it's quite cogent I think historically, and even you see it from the expansion of the Arab Islamic empire and the settling and the population uh, and the histories uh, and the exchange and the fertile exchange, in fact, with Southern Europe, um, the conviviencia with, with, with Spain and those seven, eight centuries is considered amongst the richest periods in history of, of a cultural exchange and, 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 and peaceful and religious tolerance, which we tend to kind of gloss over, particularly these days. And as we speak, clashes of civilizations, I think one should very much revisit what that period was offering uh, in a promise for civilization to exchange. And it was literally very much the product of this intercourse between the Maghreb and the southern part of Europe and by extension, the rest of Europe. Uh, the Maghreb is a political ensemble now. It has its varieties, the central Maghreb, the larger one. And I think that what you see happening um, are dynamics which are, yes, related to the Maghreb more generally in a, sorry, to the Mashreb in a, in a MENA logic, but offers the possibility of engagement around um, a series of issues that are not necessarily to be limited to a wider discussion, even if one sort of spaces it out to the wider Mediterranean. The Union for the uh, Mediterranean of 2008 comes to mind, which extends to the eastern part. No, I think that the, 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 the North African Maghreb ensemble itself is also an extremely important connection with other regions, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And I think that has been deepening in recent years. We've seen it with the extension of the engagement of Morocco towards that part of the world. 
Um, historically, it's been there um, in terms of movements that were connected into the nationalism days uh, and student exchange and whatnot. I think it's, um, it's something that might sometimes be even taken for granted in that sense. Um, and I think that the Maghreb itself should also consider um, a globalization role beyond Europe, beyond the United States, onto Africa as it's doing, onto Asia, um, and, uh, and onto Latin America. And I think that global of a framework uh, that would be customized and contextualized and historicized. I hope this addresses your question. Yes, thank uh, Yes, thank you. Great, and I think that actually sets us up quite nicely to move to the second question, um, which again, I'll just uh, read aloud. So um, you conclude your chapter by suggesting that we have an opportunity to think beyond Western statehood. And obviously in the conversation we've just been having, there's been several allusions to, to this sort of potential for, for thinking beyond kind of standardized Western models. And this is such an interesting idea. Um, and I suppose it's a bit of a creative challenge. Um, how might we reimagine a state that's not just suitable and fit for the kind of um, MENA region and the countries within that, um, but also for the kind of very sort of practical realities of life in a, in a very dynamic, very complex, globalized world facing a lot of extremely unprecedented and unique scales of challenges, everything from um, climate emergency, global pandemics, um, advancing AI, uh, huge amounts of uh, social mobility, political instabilities. Like, um, so, so no, no pressure, <laughs> not, not, a, not exactly a small question, but what, what sort of um, state project can come out and through not just the region itself, but this particular moment that we live, that we're living in? Thank you very much, Sophie, for picking up on that. I think for me, this is a very interesting research project that is in fact coming um, in parallel with this conversation about the MENA state as we were discussing and which I've embarked on in, in recent years and I have some uh, PhD uh, students working on. Uh, it starts from um, a bit of a frustration intellectually in the sense that if you historicize the state, so looking at the essentially um, the DNA of the state, we'll call it, you, you come to unearth a, a very specific story, one dominant canon, as it emerges from the classical Greek or Roman Hellenic Reformation Renaissance period in the West. And this culminates into the Westphalian state as we come to see it and know it, 1648 as such. From there on, what you see is a cementing of that paradigm throughout the long 19th century as the wars and peace and diplomacy gives us that. And what happens, and this connects with our earlier conversation, as decolonization happens, the former colonial, colonized states, in a way, have almost no choice but to ask for what that state which they see in front of them and that which they have been molded into, which is this Westphalian state uh, as it is, and pursue it and demand it, and then start practicing it imperfectly as we just documented. Now, it's important to say that historically there's nothing wrong with that. That's simply, a, it's not, there's no value judgment on that. This is a history as it materializes with the specificities of Europe. Um, a series of conflicts needed to be brought to an end uh, and from there on Westphalia happens. But conceptually, and this is what the, the piece that, that I wrote in this uh, handbook of political science on, on in search of the non-Western state as it's entitled asks is what essentially this does intellectually is it, it, it has confined our vista to one particular incarnation. It is as if the state, which subsequently will be that same perspective will be embodied in contemporary IR, Weberianism, Marxism, all of the schools, realism, neorealism and so on, all the way to dependency. It's as if that particular incarnation is the one and only possibility of what a state can be. And I suspect, and I ask that in fact, that is probably not the case. If we think in terms of universal considerations of representation in the Middle East and North Africa, in the Muslim world more generally, in Asia and Latin America, in Europe itself. Ultimately, Westphalia is a diplomatic settlement of a series of conflicts, religious conflicts too. And it builds up into the Napoleonic Wars and then World War I, World War II, Cold War, and where we are today. 
It is fundamentally based on regulation of violence. And it does not necessarily sort of give us an ontological philosophical response uh, that exhausts all the possibilities of statehood. So I do not have an answer to what other statehoods can or should be. I am more asking a question of, or haven't we painted ourselves in a corner, unbeknownst to us simply, by practicing one canon, which emerged powerfully, establishes itself, is actually relatively working fine, you know, universally. It gives us this representation, these checks and balances, this constitutionality that you spoke of earlier and so on. But I end the, the chapter by raising at least four dimensions in which one can do further research, which seem to me to point out to other configurations. One is the social contract, the nature of the social contract. What is the, what is the nature of community in relation to power? And when you look at the Middle East and North Africa, you have traditions when you read in Khaldun, for instance, and the, his emphasis on time, on duration. He speaks of, of, of the state, and he really speaks dynasties as successions, and I quote him, of duration, for instance. That gives us a different perspective on what the state structurally is, the Marxist and the Weberian state, the monopoly of violence. The second one is power, when you look at the nature of power. Here, look at the role and practice of communities in Sub-Saharan Africa, where mediation, where consensus uh, have long been established as processes, not just for settlement of conflict, but for regulation of, of uh, engagement around the notion of what we can imagine as a state. Thirdly, the question of territory. And you look at Asia, you look at the importance of transnationality, which we consider today in, in the modern day era, but transnationality practiced centuries ago um, across Asia gives a different take on the roles of irregulars, of crisscrossing spaces, of settlements, which speaks maybe of a different type of statehood and not merely empire, as in Mongol empires and so on, our images of hordes of Mongols um, invading, but, but the relationship to what power can be. And finally, the notion of struggle, which when we think of the state today and the Weberian or rather the Westphalian state, we think of essentially um, a, a, a relationship uh, of versus that particular movement versus another, uh, so clearly uh, divide and, and rule or established today in the divisions we see in the, the decaying social contract in the United States, for instance, the crisis of democracy in Europe and so on and so forth. But struggle, if you look at Latin America, for instance, in the 19th and early 20th century, you look at a struggle more as demarcation, as, as preservation of spaces in which the, 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 the social movements, as they're called back then, are able to have a different influence on the state building process. And so that's what this, the, the piece does. It, it invites a thinking beyond uh, to explore the possibilities of other statehood uh, uh, worlds in that sense. Um, thank you. There's some, there's some really fascinating ideas in here. And if you don't mind, I will just pick up again on a couple of things you mentioned. I think this idea, um, I mean, this is sort of partly a comment in some, in some respects, but these ideas that of, of maybe we rethink this notion of statehood in terms of notions like duration. Um, so rather than have this continual set sense of permanence in a particular structure, maybe we're talking about far more fluid um, entities that sort of ebb and, and flow and unequally move across space or consider themselves related or interrelated to um, sort of other centers, sort of federated models, perhaps some sort of a relationship there. This idea of struggle, um, that's really interesting because it, it's taking it away from struggle between effectively purely or being purely about struggle between sovereign powers and, and relocating it far more towards something like struggling between the social and the political principles which are active in in, in different communities or in, in all different societies at any given time. So all in all, what I'm sensing, which again, I think connects with my, or uh, with the point um, incorporated into the question about the sort of nature of the world and, and the globalization and all the various sorts of um, 
challenges and opportunities that brings. But I guess I'm seeing sort of some themes coming through away from having any sort of um, sort of static, uh, purely sort of synchronic um, account of statehood towards looking far more at how that idea can not just be more flexible, but kind of encourage greater fluidity and flexibility and, and emotion and, and be in, in sense, what are we talking about? An idea of state that's it's, it's very dynamic, something like that. Yes, very much so. I think you put your finger when you speak of this notion, uh, which I will translate more as a, as a sort of ecology of how uh, the pieces fall into place. Um, and, and here, I think the European experience that informed uh, Westphalia, rather logically, were about fixity and about predictability and, and narratives of closure. It had been 30, uh, a bit more in fact, for some of these wars between um, uh, the Dutch and the Spaniards at the time, uh, where there was a yearning for bringing a closure to that. Um, and so the gathering was about that. And so the dynamic was to, to settle, to fix in a small continent uh, where there are limited spaces and communities uh, that are increasingly sort of pitted against each other and therefore the re and princes that are no longer able to um, control their dominions. Um, and, and as a result of that, logically, the structural sort of construct that emerged was about this predictability and this fixity. Elsewhere, for the vast majority of the planet, what you had is far more evanescence, whether in the Sahel, in the Middle East and North Africa, in Arabia, in the large Asian continent across Latin America, indeed across North America, is this notion of less fixity, in fact, of possibilities of conquest, uh, which is celebrated, for instance, in the United States, uh, even with violent results, the Wild West and so on. And so this tension point about uh, a model that it was needed and is about this predictability, and is going to work or we will make it work as Westphalia did. Westphalia was successful uh, for all intents and purposes, um, but also because it was imposed colonially elsewhere and then paradoxically requested by the post-colonial state, as, as I said. So as a result of that, you have a narrative and a practice and an intellectual construct taught, again, IR of 20th century is very much anchored into that, that as a result has raised this notion of fix, uh, in, almost invisibilized fixity as the possibility to address these. And then interestingly, Sophie, when we look at what happens from the 90s onwards, we develop particularly in policy, um, back to the Alessandro's point earlier and the demands for that, we develop answers that are increasingly inviting almost the opposite of that, go local, mainstream, engage with all of these non-state actors, um, diversify, uh, look beyond the state. In fact, there is a kind of almost schizophrenic narrative about empowering above and beyond the state. Um, at, this is the time of human security, of the spreading conversation on the environment, soon enough global health, and so on and so forth, and all legitimately enrichingly. But what it does is that in a way it kind of is further weakening that state in the making in the South, uh, quote unquote, um, in the paradoxical demand for a strong and safe and secure uh, security partner, to go back to a phrase that, for instance, uh, the EU uses and, and others. And I think, to me, what this reveals is the fact that we have not exhausted the possibilities of what the concept of state can have as a promise uh, for a tool. The practice, let's be realistic, is not necessarily going to change overnight. It's been working more or less, as we said, and it's been accepted universally. But I think it's our role as social scientists to explore and, and look at these questions, particularly going forward. I think the, the 2030s, 2040s, 2050s, we will exp ex experience a lot of changes internationally. Uh, look at the role of global corporations and transnationality changing that I think will bring back this conversation about fluidity, transnationalism, whether real or digital. Um, and I think in a way, paradoxically, we will go back to those earlier questions that somehow will put Westphalia as one amongst other possibilities. 
Yeah, I think that that point you make about the Westphalian state being born very much. Um, I mean, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of funny. It's almost sort of paradoxical in a way because, as you as you said, in one point, in one sense, that it came out of a very practical set of problems that um, out of which it emerged. On the other hand, this this sort of tendency or this belief in the desirability that it would be um, fixing something, fixity, predictability, settled um, borders, um, uh, contours of the state, as it were, that would solve these problems. Uh, that's that sort of got a strong enlightenment quality to it, or the European enlightenment at any rate, this idea that uh, predictability is, is the basis for which we need to sort of found our, our kind of social, political, economic life and so forth. And then ironically, that containing in some senses the seeds of its own destruction when in attempting to maintain that fixity in order to preserve security and order, you obviously then create conflict. Um, that that, uh, <laughs> that might be more of a of a comment. I don't know if you'd like to. Not at all. I think that's you, 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 again, you put your finger on it. And when you say you end on conflict, the image that comes to mind um, is the sort of almost uh, umbilical relationship that we we have normalized between war and peace and between war and statehood. Um, again, this is, I think, the result of this elevation of the function of security in the state, um, which makes it almost to your point that uh, in the absence of war and conflict, the state in the long term becomes almost without a raison d'être. Uh, and that's why uh, Ragione di Stato, reason of state, all the way to national security uh, becomes increasingly inherent to the conversation about the state, which regularly, whether in a benign democratic way or in an authoritarian way or in a neo-authoritarian way, uh, comes to need that relationship to the people based on that um, conflictuality or the management of these conflictualities. Whereas Again, there may be somewhere the possibility of thinking statehood without necessarily this umbilical link to, uh, to war. And I think this is that fixity that, that we mentioned goes back to an incipient moment, which is 1815, in which the concert of nations, diplomacy, is born precisely on the ashes of all of these wars that had exhausted the possibility of Europe to really sort of um, uh, go beyond that. It was a case of really enough of this. And, and that fixity was both um, establishing a new order, but also solving, at least in the minds of, of, of these actors, the, the issues. It's interesting that then that violence turns internal, 1848, and the rise of discontent and questioning, and the state that is now strengthened by that concert of nations in this organized manner becomes more and more visible as, an, as a target all the way to today's yellow vests and, and other movements uh, of, of the discontent that will inevitably, inevitably arise whenever performance is not there. And the same story, of course, for the post-colonial state, which 10 years after that uh, promise of you have a state, you will be yourselves, it finds tough awakening that there's a difficult place in the sun internationally, that the IMF, the World Bank by the 1980s have structural adjustment plans and whatnot that, that ask for things. And then um, it starts resorting to that sort of forceful uh, hand on, on its populations with the consequences that we started the conversation with. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording now.